we start with a very basic question that interests us as a neuroscientist, but interests us as human beings. So how can be that the machine like that, a brain, generates our experience of being a subject, of being a subject perceiving a world outside us and being able to interact with this environment? That at the end is how the brain generates the experience of the self. Now, if I ask you what the self is, that's a very different, difficult question, and probably any of you will give a different uh, answer. But if I ask you where your self is, I think that all of you will tell me, well, it's more or less here, right? Where here means uh, at your body. And that makes sense, because the body is the point from where we perceive the world. And we perceive the world in the perspective of our body. And the body is also the medium through which we interact with the external world. So in some sense, the self is within the body. What I would like to uh, convince you uh, today is that uh, although the body, the, the self is within the body, it's not limited at the physical body. Your self doesn't finish on the surface of your skin, but it goes a little beyond. And it goes, it expands in the space where you interact with the external world. Well, normally we interact with the external world in a limited space around the body. Next slide, please. That, as a neuroscientist, we call the pre-personal space. And we have a special machine in our brain that we share with primates that really represent only the space and specifically the, sp the space around our body, the pre-personal space. There are neurons in the monkey brain that respond to something touching the animal hand, but also to something close to the animal hand, but not far. Rather, they respond more to something approaching the animal hand. So they put together something happening at their body with something happening in, within the peripersonal space. Uh, next slide, please. Now, we want to show that the same system is common to the human brain, and. It's not nice that you come in our lab and we put an electrode in your brain to measure it. So we have to come out with a smarter solution. And we invented this very simple task. You come in our lab, we place a stimulator on your hand, we ask you to respond as fast as you can when you feel touched on your hand. That's your job, nothing else. Concurrently, we present sounds that either approach or recede from your body. We tell you, please ignore sounds, just respond to the tactile stimulus. You can't. As soon as the sounds approach your body, you are faster to respond to something, to a tactile stimulus on your body. That is, your brain puts together immediately something, tactile information with audio in this case, but it works also with visual information approaching your body. So we can calculate really the point in space where this effect occurs, where something outside you is connected to something on your body. And we call it the boundary of peripersonal space. And we can measure it around the hand, around the face, around your whole body. Next slide, please. This is a sculpture by Anthony Gormley. When I saw this in exhibition in London, I thought, how this guy knows my research before I do this? Because I didn't do the experiment yet. But it really captures this idea that there is a bubbles, a bubbles of multisensory integration around our bodies. Next slide, please. And it is... Uh, uh, in, the, in the monkey brain and in the human brain, more or less the same areas do this job. And indeed, if you, st if you inhibit this area in the human brain or in the monkey brain, you lose this ability of connecting touch with the other information in the peripersonal space. There is another striking property of these neurons. That is, they are not only sensory. They do not only respond to sensory stimulation. They evoke movements. They are sensory motor. So in the brain of the monkeys, if you stimulate those areas, the area, for instance, neurons, for instance, responding to touch on the hand. You stimulate through cortical, through electrical stimulation, they do movements. And in the same things in human, if you measure the activity of the motor cortex, when you have something close to the hand, your motor cortex controlling the hand muscles is more excited. So they immediately transform sensory, sensory representation in motor acts. That's for us, a neuroscientist, is super interesting because there is, within the same neurons, an immediately connection between perception and action. Next slide, please. And this is again Anthony Gormley, who really depicted this idea of moving in the peripersonal space depending on what happens around you. Next slide, please. There is another interesting properties of these neurons. They are super plastic. This is a famous study 
made in Japan in the 90s. They train a monkey to use a rake to reach food pellets outside the peripersonal space, far, far from the body. It takes three months, more or less, to train the monkeys, but after this training, neurons that originally responded just to something happening close to the hand start to respond to something happening in a far space at the tip of the tool. That is, the peripersonal space expanded to incorporate the tool where the tool was active. Next slide, please. And of course, we wanted to test whether the same things happen in the human brain. We had subjects coming in the lab using this stupid rake to get th objects. And next slide, please. And what we found is that the boundaries of peripersonal space around the hand shifted to incorporate the tool. Next slide, please. But that's a tool, right? It's uh, a stick, a piece of wood. What happens when we have to uh, operate, when we have to interface with uh, more complex objects? And how our brain puts together things that are really human, like the hand you have seen before. So we wanted to test the amputees. And first of all, we asked what happens when you lose a part of your body? What happens to the peripersonal space? What we found is that the boundary of peripersonal space contracted around the stump when amputees didn't wear the prosthesis. Because when we tested the boundary of peripersonal space, while our patients were using exactly the similar prosthesis that, that what the one you've seen before, peripersonal space expanded to incorporate the prosthesis. As it became the real hand, so peripersonal space can embody artificial objects that have a function to extend the limits of the action space. Next slide, please. We, go, we went on on this, on this idea, and as humans, we are obsessive to losers. We use a lot of tools. We thought, let's think to a tools that people use every day with a really, really important uh, function. And we thought to blind cane to blind people using the cane to navigate, because they use the cane every day, and it is really important. It prevents harm. So we tested peripersonal space in blind, in blind people using the cane, and we found that the boundary of peripersonal space in this person is not at the hand, it's at the tip of the tool. There is really a shift towards the tip of the cane. It makes sense, because that's the new boundary. If something goes, goes over it, it, it damages their body. But this happens only when they hold the cane. Because when we tested them with a short handle in their hand, they have a peripersonal space like a sight of subjects. So this system is super flexible. It changes depending on what we do. Next slide, please. We every day use tools to extend our action space. We use the computer mouse, for instance. As you can predict, we found that when you hold the, the computer mouse in your hand and there is something happening on the screen, peripersonal space expands. Now, when I look at this picture, next slide, please, <laughs> uh, it seems really prehistorical at this stage. Now there are devices which are so more complex and so more uh, useful to interact with computers and with technology. You can buy for $70 now a thing that you put just below your screen, you move your hands, and you operate on the screen, as in Min Minority Report. Do you remember this movie? Now, why can we do that? because we have this super plastic system that is able to adapt to project what we do here in the peripersonal space to the place where the, our actions are effective. And this can have uh, terrific applications. Think to neurosurgery. There are machines, robots. There is a surgeon operating here, and the patient is in Paris, in Tokyo, in London. It projects the action space from here to there. We can do that because we have this system normally mapping the space around the body, but can be extended potentially everywhere, where, where action takes place. Next slide, please. There is the last thing I want to tell you. I think I convinced you that this peripersonal space is a space of, of interaction. What is the most important stimuli you can interact with? Others, other people. Now, the peripersonal space must be sensitive to interaction with others. So we wanted to test it. You came again in our lab, we place a stimulus in your hand, on your face, we have these sounds, and we place either another person in front of you or a mannequin. A mannequin is something that has a body, but is really not a human subject. Well, what we found is that when you face another person, your peripersonal space contracts back. You leave some space to the other. You share the space be between, the other, between you and the other. In that experiment, the other is a completely stranger. If you interact with the other, after this kind of interaction, 
your peripersonal space expands to include the space of the other. There are two things I want to tell you about this experiment. First, the kind of interaction we, we performed here was not a physical interaction, was not something really related, an exchange of things in this space that would be trivial to demonstrate. That it was an economic interaction made through computers. Subjects had to, ex to exchange money between themselves. So even so abstract interactions are mapped in this sensory motor system. Another thing, this effect occurs only if the other behave cooperatively and fairly. If the other behave unfairly, no peripersonal space extension. The limits stay there. Next slide, please. Now, how is that that the system, which I told you is sensory motor, respond to touch, respond to sounds, can map these sophisticated social interactions? Well, also, even in monkeys, these neurons respond to something approaching the animal face, but also the experimental face facing the animal. So within this system, there is the ability to remap what happens to the body of others to one's own body. Now, as humans, we are more sophisticated than, the, than monkeys, so we wanted to see whether we have the same system in, in humans and it works exactly as in monkeys. So again, you come in our, in our lab, we place tactile stimulation on your face, we ask you, please tell me when you feel touch. Concurrently, you see a picture of another person being touched by two fingers or not touched. We tell you, ignore the face. Nevertheless, when the face is touched, you feel more touch on your face. So you remap what you see on the body of others into your body. Now I told you we are more sophisticated than monkeys in these things because the identity of the face really plays a role in this ability to remap. First, they anticipated my, my talk. First, uh, the effect is much stronger if you're looking your own face. That makes sense. We, we face the mirror every day. We are used in touching and see touch. So that was expected. But also the identity of others play a critical role. So we tested subjects. First manipulation we did, we show faces of people belonging A to the same ethnic group or to the opposite or to another ethnic group. And what we found is that you have the effect only if you look at the face of a person belonging to your own ethnic group, not if you, have, if you look at out-group faces. I thought we ask you, are you racist? Not at all. But automatically, our brain map similar others more closely to us, and it's able to refer touch seen to touch felt. Second experiment that we did, so that's physical again. But what about conceptual representation? So we took subjects, politically engaged, very strong, and we show them faces of politicians belonging either to their own party or to another party. That was the most difficult uh, experiment in my life, because in Italy, political parties change continuously. But not the guy there, he's always there. So we test the subjects, and what we found is that uh, they have the effect only when they were looking faces of politicians belonging to their own political party. So even abstract cognitive representation of self and other are remapped in the system. Next slide, please. So I think I have convinced you that peripersonal space is a space of interaction. I would say it's the interface between yourself and the external world. Uh, that's, a, that's a model developed in the 60s in the, uh, with the idea of proxemics. Proxemics is the science of distance. It has been developed through an anthropological field, in the anthropological field, by looking at how much distance animals keep between each other. And then it has been extended to humans and it had strong influences on architecture, design, social sciences. Now, I think that the peripersonal space system that I explained to you, it's the neural correlates of the ability of human subjects of moving in the, wo in the world, keeping distance between each other and external objects. Now, that, that kind of distance are always physical. There is a body and there is a physical space. Now technology is challenging us in these things. Look at, you, you, probably you, you have tried that experience. You can interface with video games, you move here, and the effect is in a computer. You can play with video games with, other, with your friends everywhere in the world. Think to virtual reality, teleconferences. Your body is here, but it's projected to another dimensions. 
we can use that kind of application, the ability of ourselves to remap to different uh, spaces to rehabilitate patients. We are using it to rehabilitate motor deficits, sensory deficits, pain. Next slide, please. Think to social networks. You are acting here, you are spreading yourself everywhere. Now I think, next slide, please. Now I think the questions we are facing today are really how our brains adapt to this to these conditions. Now, that, that is, our brain needs to use the same circuit that it has. There was no changes in genetics, no mutations between the generation of my grandfather and our generation. How can we do that? Because our brain is so plastic that can adapt to different conditions, to different situations. I think the challenge now is try to understand how it does. Thank you very much for your attention.